simplifies the way we do the use of this table and then of course the analysis of the data once you run your experiments um, as a way to show you some examples of how you will achieve your analysis of the course projects for this fraction of the data. So let's just recap where you were and then we can get to the next example. In these experiments, what you're doing is you're going to find yourself on this table. And the way you locate yourself on the table is you typically will start by planning what your budget is. What I mean by that is you know how many experiments you really can run in the time you have available. You may be able to run four, eight, or sixteen or so uh, further down experiments. Then once you've located yourself in the row, you move yourself horizontally. Usually we say go as far to the right as you possibly can because that way you can investigate the highest number of factors. The thinking is that if you were going to do eight experiments, rather than investigate simply three factors, why don't you go investigate five or six factors? You don't do any extra work, but you're able to understand the system a whole lot better by doing and investigating the whole factors. So the thinking is to move yourself as far over to the right as you possibly can. And what we mean by doing that is that you're saturating your experiments. In fact, experiments all the way over to the left, I'm oh, sorry, to the right, are all saturated to the right. Now the notation you use is 2 to the k minus p. k is the number of factors. And then the remaining number that P there is the parameters that we use later on to calculate our defined relationship. We we'll looked at that on Thursday and I'll come back to that later. So P is just the, the degree by which we reduce our number um, of experiments. The next thing that's interesting out of that table is the generator. That's the part in bold that tells you how we're going to set up that. So I'm going to go back to this example a little bit earlier here, earlier here, and choose the four minus one. So in this case, we're still going to do eight experiments using four factors, and it tells me how to generate that four factor P. <coughs> so you'll recall last time what you do is you set up A, B, C, and then your final column is generated through that generator B equals A, B, C. And because we've got eight experiments, you will expect to see that in your table, A row is minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So that's in standard order. For A, P would be two minuses, two pluses, two minuses, two pluses. C is four minuses, four pluses. And then your final column is the product of those three, so in this case, it's minus. N plus plus minus the three gap plus times minus plus. So those are the those are the eight experiments and those are the settings of the four variables that you use. Now again as I was emphasized many times in this course, you do not go run the experiments in this order from the first row to the last row. Write out the eight experiments on a piece of paper and randomly draw them out of a hat or a box and note that's the order that you run. You never run your experiments in standard order. Okay, so my generator then, just as a recap from last time, that's my generator. And my defining relationship was
binding relationship between those states. We always know how long that binding relationship is going to be. Recall the two to the k minus p experiment always had two to the p words in its binding relationship. We've got eight experiments that we've done. How many parameters can we estimate from those eight experiments? Eight parameters. One of them is an intercept. That means we can estimate seven other slopes. So eight experiments. And then you can also go estimate the BC interaction. So plus the BBC, XB, XC. Okay, so that is your least squares model that you're going to calculate. And once you calculate those seven slopes plus that one intercept, you've estimated eight parameters from your eight data points, you've got no, <coughs> no more degrees of freedom.
So that was the purpose of last class on Thursday was to tell us which variables are what word that we use when we multiply them. Alias, confounded. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Jen is asking why not estimate the effect of AD? Let's go see what AD would have told us. of AD. AD is going to be confounded with some other parameters in the model. What is AD going to be confounded with? Plus BC. Okay, so what we did last time, remember we said AD multiplied by I. That's AD still. Well, I though is equal to ABCD. So that's AD times ABCD. And when that simplifies, we get A, A cancelling, B, B cancelling, and that's equal to C, B. Oh, sorry, A, and B, B. So B, C is the rate. So A, D, estimating A, D, and B, C, AB, sorry, AD and BC are aliases of each other, is what we said last time. Estimating AD and BC, they're going to wrap, be wrapped up in the same coefficients. There's my BC coefficient down there already. Okay. So this BC coefficient down here is already, in fact, not a pure estimate of BC, it's an estimate of BC plus AD. What is this term AC? Alias. AC is going to be an alias with BD. Okay? So that BD interaction is going to be alias with the AC interaction. What is this AB interaction alias? AB is alias to the CE. Okay. So this least squares model with, with all its terms over there, there's my two-factor interaction, AB, AC, BC, but those two-factor interactions are also alias with these interactions listed over there on the table. In fact, how many two-factor interactions are there possibly in this experiment? So we've got four factors, A, B, C, D. How many combinations of two letters can you make? How many unique combinations of two letters can you make? Six. A, B, A, C, D. So what you use in R is the formula function. So there's a 
nice function in R called formula, and you type formula, and you say y has regressed onto four factors, a plus b plus c plus d raised to the power of four. Notice that all I've done is that's no different to the LM. You normally use LM over here, and it's gone and built the least squared model with y predicted by a plus b plus c plus d, and all possible combinations to the fourth power. Well, I don't want to go up to the fourth power. Just to answer this question, I want to see how many two-factor combinations are there. So in other words, I want to go and see all the, all the possible combinations up to the second power. But there's a function in R that's called terms dot formula. Terms dot formula is a function that takes a formula and constructs a terms object and we'll show you what all the combinations are. So terms dot formula Combinations of settings leads to the best stability. 
combinations of settings seem to get rid of the best experiments. First combination, anything else? Only the first combination? Low acid. So Jen's suggestion is low acid. So standard order is great for just to give a visual analysis of the data. You don't even really have to go build a least squares model from this to start to see how to analyze the results. But let's go build a least squares model anyway. I'll give you two minutes. Calculate the effect VA. What would VA be in the software? In the final exam, you will have to do it for sure. What is VA? What's the sign of the photo to be? Okay. Maybe the sign. That's a great check. The easiest way to calculate these is if you've done your experiments correctly in an orthogonal manner. The answer is simply multiply the signs with the y values. So the effect of A is minus 20 plus 14 minus 17 plus 10 minus 19 plus 13 minus 14 plus 10 divided by 8. You get an answer of minus 23 over 8. 
effects of B, C, D, and so forth are calculated in exactly the same way. What is the self coefficient for B? A. So this small coefficient over there. A B two factor interaction. Same idea, calculate the AB, AB column first. So AB is plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus. And then follow the sign. So it would be plus 20, minus 14, minus 17, and so forth. So very simple to calculate that. One thing you will notice about every column in that matrix is that there is always an even number of positives and negatives. Like there's always four positives, four negatives. Indicating that those data are being centered. Being being centered, uh, remember was one of our, our centers we took earlier on. Also what you'll notice is that every column is orthogonal to the other. If you take the dot product of column A with column B, you'll always get a zero. The dot product of A with C, A with D, D with A, B, the dot product of any column with the other is zero, indicating that the all diagonal elements of X transpose X are zero. And then calculate X transpose X inverse means that you simply take the inverse of the diagonal. And so that's, that's the reason why we can take the shortcut. If those conditions are not met, you cannot take that short term. You have to calculate the coefficients using the two columns. So let me just uh, go back to R then and, and do that analysis. As you would do for your course project, you would either do it by hand or you would do it at home in R. Again, as I said, I'll post this code on the course website. So what I'll do is I'll generate A, B, C, and notice up here in this code that I selected it. I generate A, B, and C as I did on the board, and in the column B, I generate the product of um, A times B times C times A times B times C. So we put, we put that in, and then when I create that model, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it wrong first, and then emphasize what happened. So if I run this code, what I'm asking R to do is to generate me a linear model where Y is predicted by A plus B plus C plus D plus all combinations of those letters up to the fourth power. Can we do that? Why, why can't we do that? We didn't do enough experiments. So A plus B plus C plus D to the fourth power, that's a full factorial in four factors. Two to the four is we only did eight. Okay, but if you go copy and paste this into R, R will happily build the model for you. When you go take a look at a summary of that model, you'll quickly see what the problem is.
are expected. Those there are, however, the only usable terms. Okay, so let's come back and see if Jeff's interpretation is correct. Low acid, low temperature to improve stability. Does that make sense from these data? So A was acid, B was temperature. We want to maximize stability. So maximize stability says we want as low acid, that's a negative times negative, will give us increased stability. Low temperature means negative temperature times negative increased stability. C, the effect of catalyst, has a somewhat minor effect. D has no effect. So the person doing this experiment originally assumed, I think that monomer has, a, has an effect on stability. But it turns out from the experiments that D monomer really never was required anyway. Was that a waste of time? No, we've actually answered a useful question. We've now proved conclusively, because this is cause and effect, that monomer really, at least over the range that we've investigated it, has no effect on time. It's always important to emphasize over the range that monomer was varied. If we may have moved monomer insufficiently, we might need to move monomer a little bit lower and a little bit higher, and then it will start to show its effect. At least over the range we've chosen, monomer has no effect. Okay, and then a great way to visualize those data is through, through this plot that I showed a few classes back. I'll just bring it up here. Okay, so there's, there's a visualization of the, of the slope coefficients. A and B are by far the largest effects. They're blue indicating the negative uh, so that they're negative coefficients, so they will they move in that direction. C is also somewhat negative. D has D, D, C, A, C, and C, D. These are negligible coefficients as well. Now here's the here's the really nice part about fractional factorials. Recognize that factors C and D are, are probably insignificant. So what we could have done was a cool factorial in factors A and B. Okay, so a cool factorial in factors A and B. So there's factor A and there's factor B. It says that factor C that we consider going in and out of the board and factor D which we cannot visualize four dimensions. Factor C and D really weren't important. Factorial is embedded inside my fractional factorial. 
once we drop out n of the variables, we will always recover the full factorial inside of the fractional factorial. That is, in fact, how the fractional factorial table is generated up here and used. such a way so that the full factorial is always recovered once any of the factors or one or more factors gets dropped out. So that's an important design feature of the fraction factorial system. Okay, so let's go back then to last, last class. I had left it at this point where I said consider this set of experiments with factors A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. I won't go through this example in the notes. It's fully worked out in the notes, so there's no point in doing that. But what I thought to do is do a different example instead and ask you to just get very comfortable with the terminology of defining relationships, generators, and setting up a fraction factorial experiment. This is probably one of the more crucial parts of this material, is just being comfortable with setting up this experiment. So, Let's consider the following case, where perhaps for your course project, I don't think any one of you have suggested it, but you might have considered a case where you want to estimate the fuel efficiency of your vehicle. So the fuel efficiency of your car, and you want to go and investigate several factors. Let's so take factor A. Conditioner factor B might be the amount of, um, of tire pressure. Factor C, the amount of cargo or weight in your vehicle. Um, D might be the weather. And factor E will be. average speed that you choose to, to drive at. Now, how many experiments might be reasonable with this? Well, firstly, what would, what would each experiment involve?
and speed. So there's my five factors. How many experiments? 32. How reasonable? Too many. relationship. Let's pretend for a moment that we've gone and done our eight experiments. I turned around, calculated my gas mileage. How many parameters can I estimate? Eight experiments, eight parameters. One of them is an intercept. That means I've got seven slopes left. What are my seven slopes going to be?
two-factor interaction, which two two-factor interactions would you want to estimate? You're picking A, B, and why, why those two? Pressure and cargo, EC. Okay. There's three interactions that will definitely go and exist. So you can go and assign those two coefficients and estimate it next. Okay. So where, where, what I want you to go do is take this example, use this allocation, A, B, C, B, D, associated with those variables, air conditioner, pressure, cargo, window open, and speed. Write out three two-factor interactions you want to estimate from the data set, and then find out what those are going to be aliens. Notice we haven't done a single experiment yet. Before you can do the experiments, you can go find out what's going to be aliens. The reason why we do this, and this is the crucial part of today's class, the reason why we calculate the aliens is it's no good doing an experiment only to discover afterwards that it's going to be aliens with something else that's really important. This is why we spend so long designing our experiments, so we can figure out what is alias with what before we go do any work. 